In 1989, Sarah Chapman showed up at Georgetown for the bicentennial conference of the French Revolution. Uh, and she had applied here to go to here and uh, was not going to come to that year because she had money to go to Paris for a year and for some reason she decided to go to Paris for a day of in uh, French Lake. Um, but we completely misled her that we always had all, every famous French historian in North America regularly popping into uh, campus. Mac and Tom were at that meeting as well. Tom, were you, were you on the program? Were you, well, huh? I was on the program. You were on the program but where Tom Tim Tackett's house on the floor moving the pieces of paper around? No, 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 no. I didn't listen then. Oh, I just couldn't get one. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, the, the 1989 meeting had so many demands of people wanting to be here that we. I had to turn everybody down, they all got pissed off at us. Only one panel was accepted as is. Every other panel, because we had something like 60 foreign invitees or something like that. Um, so anyway, Sarah was completely misled, and when she got here, there was only one. Um, um, Sarah wrote a dissertation in 1997, mm -hmm. right? um, which was subsequently published on the Pontchartrain family. And since then, has been working on uh, France in the areas south of the Great Lakes, which one of the things, and I'll mention this before we get started, which really struck me that Canadian historians don't work south of the Great Lakes, and of course, most Americans don't know French, so they couldn't really use those archives. Wasn't it Cleveland where you told me the guy said it was the first, you were the first person ever to look at those archives? Mm, not in Cleveland, <coughs> yeah, that. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and so. American. First American. First American, right. And, and so this is, uh, this was a topic. Now it's interesting because when you started working on this project, you don't think really been using these kinds of sources. And in recent years, quite a few Americans have used a lot of French language sources in the lower Mississippi Valley in particular. I know from talking to Adam. So Sarah's going to talk to us today a little bit about, you know, one of the themes of our spring. <laughs> seminars, which is the transition from one's first book to a second book, which is a, a, on a very different topic. So before we get started, usually, well, I forgot this time, everybody introduces themselves. So, 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 Matt, you can start off. I'm Mike Glenn, a master's student. I study German. I'm Nathan Markowitz. I'm a fifth year PhD student for Mason University. I study French law and diplomacy in the French courses. Natalie Leno, I'm a first year PhD student here, and I study women in politics and social <coughs> treatments. I'm Jacob Burnham, I'm a third year PhD student here, and I study France and India in the 17th and 18th century. I'm Susan Nairmore, I'm a second year master's student, I'm interested in intersectional politics and art and government. I'm Lee Stevens, a second year PhD student here, studying French words and religion. I'm Sophan, I'm a fifth year PhD student, I'm working on a dissertation on the polarization. Jim, we'll go around to you. Yeah, I'm so. Jim Shadell. I'm uh, faculty in the Department of 19th Century Europe. I'm Eddie Cola. I work on French uh, revolutionary history and legal history. And I'm spending the semester in the department. I usually teach on our campus in Qatar. I do as a city that I teach on modern history here. And I also arrived in the summer of 1989. <laughs> <laughs> Maurice Jackson, I'm teaching in the department here. Maurice and Sarah were in class. Weren't you in class? Yeah, they were in class this year. Yeah, a couple of years ahead of me. She's right. She's yeah. not seen her much young. Yeah. <laughs> I'm Sarah. <laughs> Tom Mattis, retired from education. I work in social welfare history. I'm Matt Holt, early on in France, George Mason. Elizabeth Cross, I'm new here at Georgetown, I'm assistant professor, and I work on France as an empire in the 18th century. I'm Sarah Karmakje. I'm in the Cameron Psyche, I'm a first year PhD student here at Georgetown, and I study medieval environmental history. Alright, before we get started, just to embarrass everybody, I will mention since the Society of French Historical Studies has a weekend over, a uh, annual meeting over the weekend, and uh, Jacob won one of the Ferrar Awards, which are the main research grants given by the society when two were given in the US and Canada each year. So for his dissertation research he got one of those. And Mac Holt won the Pinkney Prize for the best book published. 
was really in front of last year. So. I bought champagne, but we spent the whole weekend drinking about it. So. <laughs> <laughs> there is wine after which we can toast it. All right, so I thought today what I'd do is first talk a little bit about how I came to this project, um, and then uh, talk a little bit about the book project, and then give you just a little bit of a preview of the chapter two, which is kind of at the heart of the book. So that's where I'm headed, and I'm going to leave time for questions and discussion as well. Um, as you heard, I was a PhD student here at Georgetown, and I was very much an early modern French historian. My first book was about networks at the court of Louis XIV, political networks, and the use of these networks by the Pontchartrain family, who were head of almost every department at some point, how they used those networks in this collaborative way to try to implement policies. So um, taking Jim and Bill Bike and Sharon Cattery's ideas about collaboration, government collaboration, and exploring that for the late reign of Louis XIV. Uh, in, the in the process of that project, I found out, uh, after doing a chapter, on the Pontchartrain as heads of the Navy and colonies, which worked together as a department during that period, that there was very little work uh, done for that period on the Navy and colonies, so it became a, you know, a, a seed that was planted that this could be a second project. Um, the second thing that pushed me in this colonial direction was where I landed at, for my career, my academic career. After I finished at Georgetown, I was extremely lucky to get a tenure track job, and I got it at Oakland University. Um, now, usually when I go to conferences and people read my name tag, they say, Oakland University, California, I love the Bay Area. And I say, well, I do too, but I live in Detroit, Michigan. That's where Oakland University is. So um, it's in the northern suburbs of Detroit in Oakland County. It's a public university of about 20,000 students. Um, and so when I landed there, I began to see Paul Chaffin's name all over the place. And in fact, I learned that Detroit had been founded by the French in 1701, so in that Louis XIV period, and then it had first been called Fort Pontchartrain à Détroit, uh, Fort Pontchartrain at the Straits. Uh, and so the Pontchartrain never set foot in North America. They were really the gatekeepers. They got to make the decision about these colonial policies, and I thought, bloom where you're planted, this should be a project that I'll work on, and I've been working on it um, since. And it hasn't always been easy. Um, what I learned is that when you're moving into new fields of history, there's a lot of work that you have to do. I knew nothing about Native American societies, and I had a lot of reading and work to do there. So um, there's, it's really a Native space for this whole period. The French are minor actors in it. And I had to learn a lot about this whole array of Native groups that are there. Um, Michael Witkin's work, Infinity of Nations, is published recently is a really good foothold for that. Unfortunately, it's only been out recently, so I had to do my work about the Ottawa, <coughs> Dot, Iroquois, all these different groups and these like very complicated networks of uh, relationships that the French were merely sort of trying to insert themselves into. Um, in terms of primary sources, there are two major series that I used in the French archives. Let's see if this works. Yeah. Um, so I use incoming uh, archival research uh, uh, correspondence, correspondence that's coming in from the colonies. So it's various people writing the ministers, it's coming into Versailles. And that's a, in the A in Colony C series for Canada. Um, and then there's a separate series that's outgoing missives, copies of all the directives the ministers are sending out in this B series, right? So um, these are rich caches of documents because in the 1690s, and I'm connecting my project a little to this phenomenon, um, the uh, record keeping became very systematized and more regularized for the ministers, all the departments across the board. So they began to keep their own archives and to try to create institutional memory. Um, and so there are a treasure trove of documents, um, not indexed usually, but um, a lot of them that come from this period, especially after 1690. So, uh, so it's very, uh, a very good thing, but also a little overwhelming to be able to work through all of these documents, very rich source of documents that a lot of people had not really looked at um, very closely or, or sufficiently. Um, my, the way that I have been trying to access these documents because I'm 
you know, don't have a very large travel budget or lots of time off, is to try to go in little spurts for weeks at a time and take images. Um, now, for better or for worse, this is mostly now um, microfilmed. So here is a picture of the microfilm drawer from the AN that I took of all the microfilm. Um, and so the originals are down in Aix-en-Provence at the uh, Archive Nationale d'Outre-Mer. And there you have to consult the microfilm as well. The microfilm seems to have been made in 1960s, 1970s. Um, and so I work at it in Paris. They have copies in Paris in the microfilm room. And I have a very kind of crude but effective workflow, which is I use TurboScan on my phone, and I take pictures, images, um, on the microfilm reader. And it creates PDF files of these documents that I can then shoot up to Dropbox. Um, the only problem is there's no Wi-Fi at the AN still, so you have to go to lunch at the cafe and upload all your documents, clear out your cache, and go back. But it's worked out pretty well. Here is um, the kind of, of resolution that I've been able to get just with my phone on TurboScan, and so that's been a real blessing, right? I just got back from a sabbatical where I got to spend four whole months there, so I, I was able to do a lot of work during that time period. Um, so in addition to the official correspondence, I also have been using um, literature, uh, travel literature, which a lot of times historians are not using, I think, and should. Uh, so these include things like relation and receipt du voyage. There's a lot of them for this period, although they're not published. So there's no publishing press in New France. Everything has to come back to be published. But I found in manuscript form a lot of this receipt du voyage um, that were written by these mid-level colonial officials who I'm interested in, and two, um, by Cadillac. So um, I talk about those not in the chapter I'm presenting today, but in another chapter and about a little group who were really pushing uh, in Paris, a group of elites pushing for colonial expansion and were using these received voyage to do that, right? So, um, so I think it's really, those are really, really interesting and there's a lot of work still to be done on those as well. Um, in addition to that, I've worked in the um, manuscript collections at the Bibliothèque Nationale. There's a lot of things there. They're kind of scattered all over the place, so you have to look for them and find them. Um, I've been to the departmental archives at uh, La Rochelle Rochefort, which are the Atlantic Coast archives, and then um, in Quebec, uh, notarial documents in Quebec. In Quebec. So um, those are the main sources that I've used, and um, so now I'd like to turn a little bit. You've already seen the, the outline for the book project, and you can see that um, my main argument here is about the agency at the mid-level colonial officials, so not just Cadillac, who founded Detroit, but also this whole other group that included Eber Beale's work in Louisiana, um, Ducasse's work to set up Saint-Domingue, so I'm trying to set him within a cohort of mid-level colonial <coughs> officials that I'm arguing really made the case to the Pontchartrain to, um, to let them go forward with their ventures, and this um, then resulted in expansion in, in uh, the colonial claims for the French starting about 1690 and into the early 1700s, right? So you've looked at that. I'm not going to go into detail just to say that um, the information I'm presenting you today comes from Chapter 2. So um, in Chapter 2, I sort of sketch out Cadillac's proposals, but first talk about his career um, and his career trajectory, what gave him the push to make these proposals to establish this new settlement in Detroit, um, and then uh, talk a little bit about the proposals themselves. So that's where I'm headed. The book project itself goes through its founding, um, and then also talks about these receipt of voyage in a French context, and then comes back to talk about um, Cadillac's removal from the post in 1710, um, because I argue he doesn't handle well the uh, relations with the Native Americans uh, who are assembled there. So, all right. So, uh, chapter two. So, um, in the late 1690s, Antoine Lomay uh, de la Mode Cadillac, that's all his names, kept adding them, trying to look more and more noble. Um, was a mid-level colonial official in New France, right? Um, and he begins to make these proposals to the ministers of the Navy and colonies, first Louis Pontchartrain, and then his son Jerome, who takes over. 
Um, during and just after, while Cadillac served as the commander at Fort Michelin Mackinac. So uh, Fort Michelin Mackinac, you can see both here and then on the map that I have you for the handout there, is kind of at the tip of the mitten um, of what is present day Michigan. So it's actually on the other side, which is also Michigan, the Upper Peninsula of Michigan, at a site um, that today is called St. Ignis, right? Um, so the way that the Canadians would get down to the site, or they called it going up, going up the rivers, is they would depart from Quebec and Montreal, um, and then usually take this upper route that's in red because they didn't want to run into the Iroquois who <laughs> were on the route to the south. Um, and so uh, this was one of the major centers for French activities. It was really the only center for French activities in the 1690s um, in the Great Lakes or the Pays den Haute. And there were two things going on there. Um, one was a Jesuit mission, and the Jesuits have been there much earlier. They go out to Michelin Mackinac, set up a, a kind of fledgling fort there in the, seven, in the 1670s, even though they'd been out before, um, and using it as a jumping off point to flying missions, where they attach themselves to different Native American groups and try pretty unsuccessfully to convert them. So they're there, and they have been there for quite a while. Uh, then in the 1680s, as a result of the continued clashes with the Iroquois, um, the governor, who's the, the kind of highest ranking colonial official in New France, who is um, headquartered in Quebec, he orders out um, a, a garrison and a commander to go out to Michelin Mackinac and set up a garrison fort there. It's really small, it's um, not defensible in any way, but they also use it as a way to defend traders who are going out and then also to, um, to, to launch some campaigns against the Iroquois. Now, one of the things that goes on in this um, site is trade, right? So the trade is going on between usually men coming down from Quebec and Montreal who go out to the Great Lakes to trade with Native American groups. And they trade um, European goods, a lot of metal goods and, um, and, uh, and cloth. And they trade that for pelts, for beaver pelts that Native Americans trap. They cure by wearing them um, next to their bodies for the winter. And then they sell them to the French who uh, are really happy to get them and then take them back to Quebec where they're sold to the Monopoly Company and then back to France. Um, now in the 1680s, Colbert had attempted to really control this trade and keep it from um, happening as much. And so he set up through the governor at the time a process where they would get trade licenses called congé. And so these congé would be awarded to 25 traders of Quebec and Montreal, and only they were supposed to have the right to go into the Great Lakes and trade. Um, they, people went in anyway, and they were called the courier de bois, or those who run in the woods. And so there was an act of trade despite this effort um, to control it by the governor and the minister uh, Colbert at the time. Uh, so there was, this was a site too for, for that kind of trade. So, um, so this is the center of Michelin Mackinac whenever Cadillac becomes its commander in 1694. But before I talk about that, I wanna talk about the Cadillac's career path because it's a little unusual. It's different from some of his cohort, uh, other men who were serving in that same period in the colonial administration, especially those in the Great Lakes region. So um, usually men who became commanders of the outline forts like Michelin Mackinac either came to France in the army already or more typically already in the troops of the Navy. So all of the troops that are, are serving in Canada, most of them, they're all pulled from the troops of the Navy, not, not the army. So most of the men who are part of this colonial administration came over having already been um, connected to those institutions. Uh, a minority also followed a second path, which was to follow the Jesuits out, usually as doné, and then somehow become interpreters because of their knowledge of native languages and then traders, and then make their way into the colonial, um, colonial administration. Uh, so those were the two kind of paths. Most of them, in either path, had pretty strong clientage relationship with the governor of New France, who was back in Quebec, and we'll talk more about who that is during these periods. Um, now, Cadillac's 
route was a little bit different in that he owed his position more to the patronage of the ministers. First, the Marquis de Signolet, the son of Colbert, who held the ministry of the, colony, of the colonies and navy. Um, and then the Pontchart Fin, who um, took it over after Signolet's death in November of 1690. So uh, Cadillac, uh, admit he tried to say that he was actually a member of the troops of the Marine when he came over. But we know that uh, that was not true, and that instead he was um, he was uh, a civilian when he arrived. So here I've got a couple pictures. I just was talking about the, the, the uh, missionaries, and then here are some images of those traders who come over, uh, the beaver that they're after, Native Americans, and then the hats that were made out of that beaver pelt. Um, so this is where Cadillac was born. He was born in this little town, kind of close to Saint Nicholas de la Grave. Saint Nicholas de la Grave has, has, has uh, claimed him, and they even have uh, supposedly his birthplace uh, and a marker out there that's a Michigan State history marker uh, for um, a little museum that's in his honor. So he's from this town. He's from a middling kind of. Um, social group. His father was probably a notary, maybe a magistrate in the local in the local court. And we aren't really sure how he gets to New France, but by the 1680s and early 1680s, uh, he's in Acadia. So he lands here in Acadia uh, in Port Royal. And Acadia is there to the, um, to the north of the English colonies. And uh, Nova Scotia, New Brunswick, and a little bit of what's present day Maine, right? So he lands, he lands there. Um, and he immediately, uh, first of all, gets into clashes with the governor there. This is a governor who's below the, the, the uh, general governor in Quebec. Um, and the first notice we have of him being there, the, um, the colonial governor out in Acadia says he's the most malicious man in the world. He must have been driven out of France for I know not what crimes. So he's already making an impression um, there in Acadia. He, soon after he's there, he begins working with a privateer, Francois Guillon, a <coughs> trader, privateer, and they're making raids down the coast, the Atlantic coast, into the English colonies, right? So these are raids that are supported by the French government, who wants the, uh, the Dutch and English settlements there to be weakened. And so they're making these raids and able to keep a lot of what they get. Um, in the early 16, or the, in the 1680, in the later 1680s, um, we see that the governor of New France, Denonville, is writing to the minister and saying that Cadillac is this great person who knows the coasts very well. Um, and this is important because the ministers, along with the governor of New France, are considering an actual military raid on Boston and Manhattan, and they need to have somebody who knows those coasts. So um, the, the governor, Denonville, is suggesting Cadillac, as well, as well as another man in Acadia, as having that kind of knowledge. Um, in uh, 1689, he is then um, signed on to this specific mission. And the idea is that under Simulay, the minister, he's going to send out a naval commander from France to New France. Uh, this naval commander will go to Quebec first and then pick up troops and supplies and then go to Acadia and pick up people knowledgeable about the coast and then make raids on New York um, and maybe Boston. So in this process, Cadillac is, um, becomes part of that, uh, that venture. And it's not really clear who suggested him. It could have been the governor of Acadia, who was pretty, uh, who was wanting to get rid of Cadillac and get him out of the colony. Um, and, or it could have been Cadillac himself, we don't really know. But he goes along. The problem with this um, mission is that the storms come up and they blow the mission off course. And instead of making the raids on New York, they uh, end up back in France. Um, and so they're back in France. <laughs> and they're in La Rochelle and Rochefort. And there we see Cadillac beginning to write letters to Simulay's bureau, to the minister's bureau, saying, I'm impoverished. I have no money. I was blown off course. I need money. I need a pension. I need some kind of support and help. 
Um, he doesn't seem to have gotten this from Simule, but he seems to have at least curried the favor with another clerk um, or commis within the bureau, this guy Lani, who begins to write back to him and they form a kind of alliance, even though it seems that he doesn't really get kind of like any pensions at that point. Um, in 1690, two things happened that pushed Cadillac to go back to France. He's been uh, back to New France. He's been in France for about six months. Um, one is that the English make a raid instead on Acadia, and news comes back that that's occurred. And his family's there, his wife and his children, and so he wants to go back to Acadia to see if they're okay. He um, later, in a letter, says that his homestead was completely destroyed, although that's probably not likely because his homestead was inland um, to the south, uh, to the, in the southern part of Acadia, rather than near Port Royal, which was hit by the English. But uh, that never stops Cadillac. He lies to pretty much about everything. So you always have to take what he says with a little grain of salt. Uh, the other thing that happens is Simule dies. So Simule died in 1690. He'd always been a little sickly, but particularly sick through the summer of 1690. Um, and when he dies, there's no heir to take over the, the Navian colony and um, the ministry. And so it goes to another ministerial plan, to the Pontchartrain. So Louis Pontchartrain, who was the acting controller general um, of finances, takes on this department of Navian colonies in addition to his position as controller general. Um, and this marks then the movement of this department from the hands of one ministerial clientage network to another. However, Pontchartrain does not purge the Colbert uh, network, which had been at the helm of this department for several decades by that point, half a century. Instead, he retains everyone, including the people that Cadillac has made a, a kind of a beginning connection to in the Bureau. So um, Cadillac returns then uh, to, to, to New France, and as a result of his contacts in France, he begins to see um, some movement of his career, right? Um, and, um, and we begin to see him move up through the ranks. One of the things that changed, and perhaps this official was even on the same boat back to New France with him, was the change in the governor. So in, um, in 1690, into 1690, into 1691, the governor of New France um, is recalled, and Frontenac, who had been the governor before, is sent back out. So uh, Frontenac, the governor, had already served one term and had returned to France. He's sent back out in um, in, in 1689 to begin his term in 1690, and we see him then um, back into New France there. So beginning in the 16, early 1690s, Cadillac has secured several appointments within the troops of the Navy. First, he's made a captain, a captain en pied, or captain, a captain reformé. That seems to be at the behest of the ministry and not at um, Frontenac's doing. And then in 1692, he goes on another expedition to map, this time, uh, the settlements in New England. So he goes along with a map maker and a hydrographer uh, to go along the coast and to map. And he doesn't get blown off course this time. They actually finish the mission. After that, in, the 16, in 1692 to 1693, he writes a series of memoir to the minister reporting and describing what they saw on this reconnaissance mission. So it's kind of through this process, Cadillac learns two things. He learns the really importance of networks and of building networks with the ministers and the men in the minister's bureau back at Versailles. He also learns the importance of how to write these memoirs and these reports that get the attention of the minister and, um, and can help move his career forward, right? So um, part of this project I'm connecting to this kind of regularization, standardization, of, um, of the institutional memory of the departments um, at the end of the reign of Louis XIV. We begin to see a standard way of writing these memoirs um, and composing them that, um, that, that then uh, the ministers expect and those who are mid-level officials begin to master. And Cadillac does this through these processes of these earlier missions that he's on. Um, so in 1694, Frontenac, then governor of New France, names Cadillac to be the commander of Michelin-Mackinac, right? 
um, after he's been on these reconnaissance mission, missions, had contact with the Minister's Bureau, and written several of the memoir about them. Uh, this is still a very curious choice on Frontenac's behalf. So Frontenac gets to choose who the commanders of these outlying forts are, um, but it's surprising he would choose Cadillac. First of all, they're still engaged in these battles with the Iroquois in the region. So the region here, uh, this is a map from 1703. You can kind of see Michigan, present day Michigan, it's a little pointy, but it's pretty close. <laughs> Uh, the Iroquois are still making major raids uh, in this region and even hitting the settlements in Quebec and, and Montreal. Uh, and so to post Cadillac out at this very important post in Michelin Mackinac is, is surprising because he doesn't have any experience um, in these kinds of wilderness style raids. He also um, has really no experience in battle at all on the ground. Uh, he also has no experience in uh, relationship building with the Native American allies that are there. So uh, the Huron and the Ottawa have been longtime allies of the French in the region. And um, by this point, uh, they have built these kinds of rituals called middle ground rituals. Uh, Richard White talks about them uh, that, that cement these alliances. And Cadillac doesn't speak any of the native languages. He doesn't know about these rituals. And so he's a curious choice to send out at a time when it was very important to, to, to maintain and solidify those, those relationships. He leaves in September 1694 from Quebec out to go um, and it'll remain there then um, for three years. So during his time at, at Michelin Mackinac, he does what the previous commanders had done, and that's he augments his own personal fortunes. He figures out how to do that pretty quickly through the gray economy in the region. Right? So um, as a, a royal official, as a colonial official, he's not supposed to be trading at all in anything. Um, so he's totally banned from the trade. Nevertheless, uh, he engages in trade while at Michelin Mackinac, Mackinac routinely. Uh, and, and we know that other commanders did this and other soldiers did it. Pretty much everybody going into the upper country of the page of notes smuggled goods in and then sold them um, for their own personal gain. So we see uh, him making shipments of things from Quebec, needles, um, fishing hooks, hatchets, knives, copper pots, and brandy or eau de vie. Uh, pots and pots of brandy and eau de vie out to exchange with Native Americans there for these beaver furs. Uh, we know about this because of a court case uh, that's brought before the court in Quebec in 1697 and 1698, but it's based on an incident in 1696 when he's commander, and that is that he, um, he engages these men to bring down goods, and Frontenac, the governor, okays the shipment of these goods, saying that they're supplying the fort. However, he brings down more than he's allowed to. Um, he even, his, his wife, who is living in Quebec, engages, um, we can see from notary documents, engages these men as a side deal to bring even more goods down, uh, reportedly over 3,000 livres worth of goods, uh, down to Michelin Mackinac. And we know about it because once these men arrive, Cadillac begins to dispute with them, and they um, have this dispute that then spirals downward to where the men, uh, he imprisons, imprisons the men, um, seizes all of their stuff, they go back to Quebec and file a court case against him. So it lays bare really this whole uh, system that uh, of illicit trade and, and the gray economy in the region. It, it suggests that Frontenac may, the governor may have had a hand in it as well. Um, during his time in Michelin Mackinac, he also becomes embroiled in a series of heated conflicts with the Jesuit missionaries there. Um, and you're at a Jesuit institution, I don't have to tell you it's always a bad idea to fight with the Jesuits, right? Um, and especially in this case because their conflict spills over for several decades and the Jesuits doggedly keep writing to everyone, to the governor, to the minister, they're very articulate, they're not giving up. Um, and they seek really to try to destroy Cadillac's career, right? Um, and so their problems with Cadillac stem from long-standing disputes with the port and the, there and the trading there. Uh, they don't like the influence the traders and soldiers have on their efforts to convert Native Americans. They don't like them converting 
with Native American women, um, and they especially don't like the sale of brandy and eau de vie to Native Americans there. So uh, Cadillac gets on their wrong side, and we'll see that conflict continue. <clears throat> what pushes Cadillac then to really make a proposal for a new a settlement in, uh, in the Great Lakes is a shift in royal policies. So um, in 1696, there's a huge glut in the fur trade, huge glut of, of furs that are remaining in France and sold. So these belong to the monopoly company that has the sole trading rights, and um, their, uh, their lease is up for renewal. And the minister's very concerned they're not, the investors are not going to re-up the lease. So he begins, um, at this point, it's Pochafa, beginning to implement these policies designed to try to address the glut of beavers. Um, so in La Rochelle, for example, in 97, there were um, uh, over 850,000 livres of weight worth of beaver pelts that were just rotting in the company's warehouses. Um, and so one of the problems is the quality of the beavers. Many of the beaver furs are coming in having not been cured, uh, and so they're worth less. But the other problem is the shift in fashion in Europe, that beaver hats are no longer the rage, and instead textiles from, um, from the Levant. Uh, from the east are much more, much more prized. So Pontchartrain, this time Louis Pontchartrain, makes a, a, a kind of very um, dramatic policy change. And he says there'll be no more congé, there'll be no more trade permits issued going forward for the next few years and to the foreseeable future until the glut is, um, it is over. And he also proposes closing all of the ports in the Pays and Oats, which would include Michelin Mackinac and then a kind of seasonal port um, down to the south of St. Joseph. Um, but Ma Michelin Mackinac would be the main one, and Fort Frontenac, which is on the route down. <coughs> so Frontenac, the uh, governor, as well as the traders, as well as um, most of it, everybody who's in Montreal and Quebec are very frightened about this prospect, especially the closing of the forts. And they begin to write the minister and the court to try to reverse this policy or talk Pontchartrain out of it. Um, and Cadillac's among them. So he writes a series of, mis of, of missives about how important the, the post is, uh, trying to use all the arguments he can think of to persuade the minister to keep them open. In 1697, um, Cadillac finally asked for a release from his post for a year congé. Um, and he seems to have done this realizing that the post will be closed and he's not going to have a job anymore. He wants to go back to, to, get back to Quebec, regroup, figure out some kind of way to salvage his career, his next step. So he goes back to Quebec. Um, he begins to write a kind of receipt de, uh, receipt de voyage or relation about Michel Mackinac. So this is a, a kind of small book length uh, literary work. Uh, it's five chapters long. The original is actually at the Newberry Library in Chicago. Uh, and it's for a general reading audience back in France. The first part is a, a description of the site at Michelin Mackinac. It's written in this kind of receipt de voyage way. Uh, and then he talks about the Native Americans who are there. The second half is this sort of strange ethnography, a little bit in the style of the Jesuit relations, mainly about the Huron and uh, the Ottawa near Michelin Mackinac. Um, there, I think he's trying to show he was an expert in Native American cultures and societies. So he writes that it's not published. He writes letters uh, to the ministers trying to keep the forts open. And then he finally uh, decides to, to go to France. And this is when he really proposes Detroit. He comes up with the Detroit proposals. So I think we can see that pushed into a corner, fearing the closure of Michelin Mackinac, the end of his trade there, he's trying to devise ways to, to, to keep his career on track. Um, and to keep his hand in the fur trade in the, in the Great Lakes with this major policy shift that's happening. So um, he's in France in 1697, uh, and two things happen. One is that Pochettrain's eldest son, Jerome, begins to take over the day-to-day -day activities of the 
bureau of the Navy and Colony. So there's Jerome there. Um, Jerome had gotten a certain vols, or kind of the, the okay to begin to train and to be take over his, his uh, father's position at the helm of the Navy and Colonies in the early 1690s. Uh, by 1698, uh, 99, he's old enough to really take it over when his father becomes the chancellor. So uh, he had been shadowing his father, reading all of the correspondence, but by the fall of 1698, and really by 1699 fully, he's taking over the day-to-day -day, um, oversight of the department. And the other thing that happens, and this is not to, to Cadillac's advantage, is Frontenac died, um, and his position as governor is given to Calier. And Calier, we'll see, is going to embark on um, a, a project to try to make peace with the Iroquois. Um, and Calier is not train client. He's also not um, very amenable to Cadillac's ventures, so this will make it harder for Cadillac to um, realize his project. In 1699, we see a flurry of debate around Cadillac's proposals for Detroit. So there's not sort of one um, archival document that we can point to as the proposal. Instead, what we have are a series of letters um, that are written by crit critics of the proposal, and then sometimes critics of the proposal, their problems with Cadillac's idea and plan, uh, then with Cadillac responding to them. And so in some ways that's better than having just the proposal itself as we get this kind of dialogue between a lot of different groups about Cadillac's plans. Um, the Pachetons, both Louis and Jerome, had opened up this debate in a way because um, Cadillac had first made a proposal to them, and then in 1699, May of 1699, they send it back to the colony, to the governor and the second king of the Attendant, and ask them to circulate it, to even have an assembly, um, and to discuss this proposal, and then to send back a report about what everyone has to say about it. And people have plenty to say. So we have a lot of different groups weighing in about the proposals of Jesuit missionaries, merchants in Quebec and Montreal, the merchants connected to the, to the Monopoly Company. Um, we have, through different people, the Native American groups themselves, especially the Ottawa, who were the most longstanding uh, allies of the French in the region. So, um, and then the Intendant, too, the second in command, we have what we have to say about it, and the governor, Calier. So, a lot of different voices. So, here I want to sketch out just the main um, outlines of the proposal and um, talk about the, the, the challenges to it. So, the proposals, first of all, begin to move a little bit. So, with this today, Cadillac changes the terms of his proposals in direct conversation with the challenges that are put forth. So um, one of the things he proposes is he wants this to be a center for Native American alliance building, and he wants the groups, he wants to attract the groups like the Huron and the Ottawa, who are more up closer to the Michelin Mackinac region, he wants to, to attract them down and have them establish their own permanent settlements around Detroit. Um, he argues that this will create a kind of unified force of Native Americans that will support the French and will also serve as a bulwark against the Iroquois, right? So he wants to use them to help uh, shield against the Iroquois and the Iroquois allies, the British. Um, the other thing he also proposes in terms of the economic activities there, this is where he has the most movement. So initially he talks about doing trade at the post. He acknowledges with the glut that they would have to probably um, only have two or three years where they would not be having any trade at all, but then it would be reintroduced and it would attract only the highest quality furs that would be, then be sent to the Monopoly Company in uh, Quebec. That garners a lot of challenge from the fermier and from merchants in Quebec, and so he begins to change his tune, and by the end, his proposal is there will be no trade at the port, Instead, it will be um, a settlement of uh, families that will subsist through the cultivation of crops um, and not trade. Nobody believes them, but that's what he says. Um, so those are the kind of main contours of his, of his proposal, um, and, and that's the ones that get circulated. 
right? <laughs> so positioning Detroit then as a kind of permanent settlement of colonists, he's making it sound very different from the outposts that had been put uh, earlier in the, in the page and note that had been comprised of missionaries, traders, um, and not colonists. So he's hoping to attract people from Quebec and Montreal down to live permanently at Detroit and to make their living through the cultivation of crops, not, not through trade. Um, so his proposals then uh, spark uh, uh, many challenges from different quarters. Uh, the Intendant Champigny, uh, along with the Jesuits, here's a document from Champigny, and you can see these are the proposals for Cadillac on the right, and then Champigny's response to them on the left. So you see this a lot sometimes in the archives where, if you're lucky to find them, it, the, there are proposals on one side and then the kind of counter proposal on the other, the really rich sources. So um, here are the intendant's main problem with Cadillac's proposal was he said he's really going down there to trade. <laughs> he's going to go down there and trade secretly and with the congé not being given at all, he'll be the sole person to trade. He's also perfectly situated in Detroit to trade um, rather than bringing it back up and trading with monopoly companies. He would be funneling first through the through the Iroquois to the British, right? Um, and so he's against that. He also cautions that bringing all of these Native American groups in close proximity could cause problems and disputes between them. The French would expect it to be mediators um, under the, the um, role of the middle ground, and that uh, that could cause problems uh, for the French with their allies along with the, the explosion of potential violence. Um, if, if, they were, if they agreed to be relocated, right? Uh, the Jesuit missionaries had very similar complaints. They wrote multiple missives back to not only their own superiors, but also to the minister to uh, say that Kellek was very likely to be trading, that he was also going to bring OGV or Brandy into the region, um, and that this would cause great dissension among the native allies in the Payton Oats. Um, finally, the, uh, the governor, Kaye uh, also weighed in. His main concern was about the Iroquois. So he'd been engaged engaged in negotiations of, with about 35 different Native American groups in the region uh, to try to reach peace. And this would be a monumental peace. Um, the French couldn't dictate it at all. They were kind of one cog in this very large network. Uh, but they was looking very good. And he was afraid that, that establishing Detroit, even talking about establishing Detroit, would alienate the Iroquois, who were right next door, and uh, put in peril this peace that he had been working so so diligently on. Um, and so that was his main concern. Um, he worried that it would anger the Iroquois and then potentially alienate the other Native American allies um, in, the, in the region. Kellier, though, kind of withdrew his, his uh, opposition in 1701, around 1700, 1701, whenever it looked like the Iroquois would agree to peace. And so this is uh, a copy of the Great Peace of Montreal, uh, which was signed a month after the Detroit's founding, but was in the works by then. Uh, and here you can see the signatures of different Native American groups uh, who signed the treaty. Uh, there were about 20, over 25 groups altogether that came together and, um, and agreed for a great alliance. So with the Iroquois opposition removed, Calle also removed his opposition. And although he dragged his feet, agreed that um, Cadillac could found, the, uh, could found this, this new settlement um, with the ministers okay. So the ministers understood they're okay, uh, Calier begins to lift his opposition. Um, and so finally, then in July of 1701, Cadillac left Quebec uh, with um, about 52 uh, voyageurs and 50 soldiers, one Recollet, uh, one Jesuit, and his nine-year-old son in a series of canoes. They took the upper passage because the uh, Iroquois peace was not yet, and they arrived at Detroit and put up a very, very crude, um, very, very crude palisade fort, uh, and there we can see the fort right at the bottom of this map here, uh, with 
Native American groups uh, beside it. So uh, the Native American groups that do come, they come by 1702, Huron, Ottawa, uh, later the Miami and the Ojibwa. I talk about all of that in, the, in another chapter and talk about the development of the of the site. It remains um, not a, a site that there is any kind of cultivation of crops. It's a trading outpost, just as the Jesuits and Anton Don had suspected. <clears throat> you can see from the goods that he takes down that that's going to be the case. He says he needs some goods in order to curry favor with Native Americans, but he's taking 1,500 catfish hooks, uh, 1,000 sewing needles, and uh, 54 pairs of women's stockings when no women are going along on the, on the venture. So that tells us uh, that, that this is really about trade, and that's exactly what happens. So uh, that's I, what I have for today, and I'd like to hear your questions or comments. Before we get started, uh, do, uh, some of you were uh, <coughs> in Agnes talk weeks ago. Um, and you may recall at that point we did have a discussion about how this is the key period in routinization of record keeping. Right? You talked about that before, how at this point you have the ministries having archives, you have the principle established that the minister's papers belong to the government rather than the individual minister. And as you pointed out, and as she discussed in her paper, you also have standardization. And some of you have seen the documents, and see that already there's something in the cold air where people want specific information to better know how to draw up the documents. And we actually have things where they explain to people how to draw up a given type of document. There are very clear instructions about how to do this. So, really, is an interesting example of how there's a significant shift. And as she suggested, I think, and you're showing here, a lot of it does have to do with overseas mm -hmm. activities that then are having an influence on state practice. Back. So I, I just have one quick question. Is mm -hmm. that carried out the brother or, or related? Yes, he is. Yes, he's the brother, he's the brother right? Brother. He's the brother. And he's part of the Colbert Percy right. plan, right? So uh, he may have made this decision to allow the project to go forward because he was not Hanshan as client. He was trying to create so the Kalyav, I'm asking that François Kalyav, who wrote that was the Dossier en France in the Gator, which is the holy red bible of 18th century diplomats who have had to negotiate between each other, so this guy is the, um, and he was involved in the 14th diplomacy in the okay. 17th. And Kalyav, before he became governor of Quebec, or a governor in Quebec, he was governor of Montreal for a decade. So he was very well versed in um, how to negotiate with Native Americans in the middle ground rituals. So he had kind of both the European diplomacy mm -hmm. and the mission to get that done, <coughs> show his brother a little bit maybe, and then um, he had a toolkit for engaging Native Americans. Right. All right. So, Kim, you have Yeah. Uh, I'm curious, what was the expectation that these tribes would be attracted to mm -hmm. come down to Detroit, uproot themselves? and settle in this uh, obscure location. Right. Well, he would make, he was making the argument initially of trade, and then he had to kind of backpedal on that when the premier were worried about the illicit trade that might happen there. Um, so, yeah, he made it sound like there was going to be this sort of assimilation campaign that they would bring in um, recollets, because he didn't want the Jesuits there, and Ursulines to convert the Native Americans there. But he didn't talk much about why they might be persuaded to come. And they're, they're sovereign nations. They would have to be persuaded, right? Um, and in fact, that's one thing that the Intendant and also the Jesuits pointed out, that they were very unlikely to come, or if they came, there was no way for them to subsist there. Um, and that he, he kind of didn't know what he was doing when he was making these arguments about the Native American groups. And, and that is borne out later because there are there are clashes and a lot of Native American historians see this move as helping to, to pave the way for the Fox Wars that happened in the 1710s. So there's a connection there to this to the Fox Wars. Yeah, so good. I have two questions. The first is like uh, oh, no. uh, <laughs> 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 um, 
Sarah, could you say a little bit more about how your narrative mm -hmm. fits into the larger narrative of New France? Mm -hmm. uh, your argument is very clear for this particular period in Lorraine and Louis. Right. This is clearly a, a period of expansion mm -hmm. in New France. How does this fit into the larger story? And is this a particularly significant moment in the expansion of New France? Right. My first question was related to this on him. Can I also? Yes, I okay. was, I was yeah. also curious about like your, so how this connect to your earlier research about like capitalism as a social collaboration and networks and all, and I like like you know all of that, and this I'm doing all these things. So it's the communications and everything. So how does it fit into that? And also like what about his like intellectual kind of. I don't know, standing like, because he has been writing a lot of letters and reports and everything. So, like, when he's making his arguments, like, who are the influences on him, who he's using. So, can you also, you know, point him, like, in the intellectual landscape of the plans and the plan and the political thought, maybe, like, political economy and all that? So. Sure. Okay. So, um, you know, the, the historiography for New France is kind of all over the place because you have Canadians who have a particular kind of historiography, and then even among the Canadians, there's like the Francophone and the Anglophone Canadians. So a lot of the Francophones don't write much about new, uh, about the Pavin Oat and Great Lakes. They're really focused in on the St. Lawrence settlements, and there's not much discussion about what's happening out there and how it affects Quebec and Montreal. The Anglophone um, historians, especially Eccles, who uh, published, you know, in this in the, 1960s, 70s, and 80s, his argument was kind of Colbert's argument was that if you extended these settlements and claims out to the west, it would weaken the colony and ultimately bring its downfall. And Eccles actually argues that this movement west really weakened the colony and brought it ultimately into conflict with the, with the British and resulted in the Seven Years' War and the loss of the colonies, right? Um, so. My argument is, is to say that, first of all, Colbert really didn't have this compact colony policy that everybody says he did, including Eccles, uh, in that I'm gonna, in the first chapter chart that actually the Colbert age, there were these mid-level officials who were constantly making plans for ventures and asking for authorization, and they got them. LaSalle goes west, he finds them, or he gets the help of Native Americans already know it's there, the very um, head of the Mississippi. And then in this period, what we see is a reorientation towards that expansion, I think. Um, again, it's claimed they're not really able to defend this area. It's a, a native space. But I think it's, uh, Detroit becomes an important jumping off point for also the, the French claims in Louisiana that are happening at the same time. Um, and then their expansion in the Caribbean as well, right? Now, um, French historians have often thought that all of this is happening because of the reorientation of, uh, of European connections and alliances on the, eighth, the seven year of uh, the war of Spanish succession. And what the French are trying to do is to orient themselves so they can take over the Spanish um, claims in, in New France and the Atlantic world and that they could counter the British. Um, I'm not 100% sure that's true. I think that more what they're doing is seeing opportunities that are presented to them by these mid-level guys out in on the ground. Uh, I think that Jerome Pochettin wants to make a mark, and uh, he's young and ambitious, and he starts saying yes to all of these mid-level officials who are making making uh, proposals at the time. So it's a it's a really pivotal moment where the French claim are expanding exponentially, not just in North America, but in, in the Atlantic world. Um, so it's kind of an important point for, for New France. Um, in, in terms of Cadillac, we don't know a lot about his intellectual formation. We know he must have gotten an education because he writes well. Um, he uh, is... Well, one of the earlier historians who worked on some of this stuff said that you have to be very careful because every statement he makes, is, is unless it's corroborated by other evidence, you have to assume it's not true. So he makes up a lot of things, and that makes him fun to study because he just says outrageous things all the time. Um, he was trying to defend against the, the Jesuits saying that he shouldn't 
take ODB into the region. They said, well, we eat a really crude diet, and we need a little brandy to be able to settle our stomachs after. So he, That's reasonable. Yeah, so I think he's just, he has this kind of bombastic style that gets reined in a little as he's trying to write these memoirs, and he realizes he has to write in a certain format to get the attention of, of the minister. So he seems to be kind of always struggling against that. He said the early work, but you know, collaboration and the networks and Right. So yeah, I mean, I definitely started looking about these plantage networks and connections and to see who was connected to whom. Um, earlier scholarship always had credited Governor Frontenac as being his client, and he was the reason that Cadillac rose up through the ranks, and I wanted to look at that a little more closely, and I found it was not the case that it was the ministers instead who imposed on Frontenac uh, to ask him to, to promote Cadillac. So I'm always looking to see those connections and how they're working. So I have a question that's kind of springing off of Max's question, which mm -hmm. is that throughout both the description and your talk, there's there's one term that you never use, and that's empire. And mm -hmm. I was wondering, is is this a history of empire? And if not, then what is, what is this? What is this entity yeah. that we're talking about? You know, I have to kind of agree with Pritchard, who talks about this expansion as not being really empire because it's, it's piecemeal, it's made... Um, at the moment, it's spun, somewhat spontaneous. I don't think they sat with the map and said, you know, we're going to put forts here, 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 and here. And I think my underlying argument is that it's these mid-level officials who are proposing these, and then they're being vetted, kind of one way or the other. Um, in the sources themselves, it, the way that they're organized when they're in the incoming correspondence is that there's all of the correspondence, there's a dossier for the correspondence from the, from the governor and intendant, and then there's a whole section that's just called memoir, and these are unsolicited memoir that are coming in, and they're clearly, I don't know if all of them are being preserved by the, by the officials, but enough of them are that it makes you realize that, you know, this is where the movement's coming from, it's not coming from above, it's coming from people on the ground like Cadillac, and they're um, assessing whether these will work or not, and working with the, the ministers are with the, the governors and people on the ground, but they don't have a plan, they don't seem to have a systemic plan of the empire. It seems like a, a kind of surprise or opportunity. Can I jump in on that for a second, because I think it is, in a sense, back to your question, that, that uh, closely related, because a number of years ago, back in the early 2000s, I had a PhD student uh, who came to a census and decided to go into the digital world and make a lot of money. He was curious. Uh, he gave some of to us, I'm sure. But um, he had a fascinating time. He was a native speaker of German. And he was interested in um, a comparison of French policies in Alsace, looking at Colmar, and French policies in Freiburg during the occupation of Freiburg. And of course, there's a lot of all this rhetoric at the time, you know, that we're going back to Caesar and the Rhine as the natural frontier, blah, blah, blah. And therefore, you would treat Colmar one way because it's naturally part of France. You would treat Freiburg another way. And what he found at the ground level in a couple of chapters that he wrote was that that's totally awesome. And that's exactly as you're describing in the New World, that it's ad hoc, that the policies being followed in both places are very, very similar. And that they're, they're you know, in the minds of the government, the Rhine is not some frontier that they're sticking with. When they have the opportunity to grab Freiburg, they grab Freiburg. When they have the opportunity to grab Luxembourg, they grab Luxembourg. They have to give it back. But that, you know, the idea that there's some sort of coherent plan to take things, or that we want to build up to the Rhine, that there was no evidence about this. So, so it's kind of interesting. That talk about so Elizabeth's question raises another question. How in the world did they expect to compete with, never mind, defeat the Spanish and the English in North America. Right. Well, the Spanish aren't much of a threat to, to New France, because by that point, they're not really anywhere close to them. But the British are a little bit more worrisome, and definitely Cadillac uses that as one of the many things he throws up against the wall to see if it'll <coughs> get support. So he, he keeps talking about the British as they're, if they're beginning to move into that sphere um, what he's really talking about is trade, and they're allied with the Iroquois, so he's worried that there's going to be trade siphoned, warning about trade being siphoned off. But, 
you know, the British are still very much isolated within the New England colonies in this period, so there's a big geographic uh, kind of space between them. And the regular French rates. And the regular French rates, uh, yeah. You can still see the, the, you know, some of the houses in Deerfield from the great Deerfield they are still right. left over. And they mostly use, like, their Native American allies, you know, right. like Jimmy, Abenaki, to yeah. go down. Bruce. Yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, sir, you mentioned uh, when you started that you looked at a lot of travel literature. Mm -hmm. And then I think Jim said at one point, uh, travel literature became not, uh, or you, that, that it became not the property of the person, but of the, of the, of the authorities. So, now, now I know a little bit about travel literature, let's say, on Africa, Dozo and Barbell and those in the late, late uh, uh, 16th century. But, but how does the travel literature, how does it characterize the native peoples. Or what kind of description does it give them? Is there any of it ever kind or cordial? Is it? Because I know they're trying to use this to bring forces there. Right. Well, um, most of the kind of ethnographic literature had been done by the French Jesuits earlier, so 1630s through like the 1660s was the heyday of the Jesuit relations. Um, and there's a great new book out by this guy Micah True, who's written about that ethnography, and it's really interesting arguments and findings. Um, so other writers are piggybacking a little bit on that tradition um, and Cadillac among them. But then there's this other tradition of, of the explorer's literature, right? We went here, we did this, and that comes from these journals that explorers kept. And they were kind of like naval love that then morphed into journals that then kind of morphed into <coughs> general leadership. And so those were a little bit different, and that's also what Cadillac tries to write. Um, now during this period, what's really interesting, and that's something I do in another chapter, is that Paul Chatelain also had in their ministerial dossier um, the authorization for publication of books in France. Um, and they didn't publish any travel literature during this period. So the question is sort of were they suppressing that, um, or were there just not things being written, well, I found a lot of things in manuscript. And I think if you were writing these in the colonies, mm -hmm. your your problem was to get them back over in manuscript form. They circulated sometimes in manuscript form, but then you wanted to try to get them published. But if you can't get the royal authorization to publish them, you know, then what do you do? Yeah. And so, like, get, get to, who's up the royal, the royal yeah. government, right, to be able to publish, you had to get that, um, that authorization. Now, I found the, the register of where the incoming books you wanted to be published were written down, and then even note what reviewers were given that mm -hmm. those books to see if they could be published or not. Mm -hmm. So I've still got to go through um, the remaining volume of that to see what happened. But um, some of them were published abroad. La Fultana, whose map I used here, he, his book is published in, in London and in, in the Netherlands in the early 1700s. But part of that is because he deserts and he goes back to Europe and it, then, you know, his persona non grata in, in France. So he's trying to publish as a way of figuring out what he's going to do with his life um, after deserting. Mm -hmm. But there's um, one um, book link received a voyage that's written by Tonti. Uh, who, Henry Tonti, who was one of LaSalle's compatriots. LaSalle died, of course, so you know, his stuff um, gets published in France, but through other intermediaries. So there's, that's an interesting question, sort of, of if the culture trains roll it out, are you trying to suppress it? Um, they're clearly not trying to get it out there. Uh, so I have to follow up a little bit on that. Thank you. Just a point of information, like that, 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 Point. The chancellor's office was mm -hmm. in charge of mm -hmm. the permissions. And so once Paul Chartrand failed, he becomes chancellor. Normally, the chancellor doesn't do it himself. He has it far out. out to somebody else. But his office had full responsibility. Mm -hmm. So, come on, you have it. Yeah, uh, I had a question about mm -hmm. chapter 6, not chapter 2. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, very sad. I, I'm like, really interested in like, uh, the concept of like, middle ground. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's because it, it is like related to like a Megan and Elizabeth's question is like uh, the how do we like interpret like uh, the characteristics of the French colonial society or like the French ethnic empire? Because it's like a, 
So, so I think that it's like a cardiac like a refusal of like uh, the building ground or like a reciprocal like a relationship between like French colonialists and like the Native American. So, so, so can we like uh, interpret like a cardiac like a refusal that is like a, that kind of some transition from the like a little bit neutral like a relationship to more like coercive like a, the colonial like a society because it's like a Brad Rushford that said that it's like a that there is there are two types of like uh, colonial society in the French Empire. So the first one is like a new French new French like uh, colonial society so based on like mutual like recognition. But it's uh, in the other part is like uh, the Caribbean society is more like a policy, like more like importing society. Mm -hmm. So it's a uh, early eighteenth century is like a cardiac refugee is a can we like interpret like a so a signal of a transition from the like uh, more like a little bit mutual recognition to a like important society? No, I, I think it's a personal quirk for the <laughs> 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 because he's clearly out of step with all of his cohorts in the pagan of and it doesn't work, right? So he actually, I argue in this chapter, gets recalled for bungling the relationships with the Native American groups in that region and not adhering to his expected middle ground um, role, right? Uh, so it remains throughout this whole period very much a native space dictated by Native American groups and not by the French at all. So when I'm examining all of these questions about the French, they're really operating without any ability to coerce or impose. And Cadillac, for whatever reason, doesn't get that, you know. And he he has this horrible campaign where he he goes. Um, there's a, a dispute that accelerates between the Ottawa and Huron. He mismanages the peacemaking process that's supposed to happen that he's supposed to facilitate. He instead goes on campaign, but then he like hides behind a tree and doesn't <laughs> participate in the battle at all, causing dishonor, you know, for for the French as well as for himself. And then. He just, at every turn, is bungling the thing. And he um, constantly sends out an, uh, an inspector who writes a report about it that's damning. And a lot of it is from the Ottawa. Um, and there are discussions of these incidents. And then um, Cadillac gets removed. <clears throat> so before, there, the discussion had always been he was moved, removed because he was illicitly trading. But I don't buy that. If you read the report, it's pretty clear what the concern was for the ministers and the people on the ground was just he didn't get his role. He was not doing doing what he needed to do in the middle ground. Yeah, it's interesting. The native pressure that dancing. Yeah, it's getting so in the French government. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. oh, Thanks. I have a question that just piggybacks directly on that. Um, about Cadillac, and maybe there's not enough evidence in your sources to answer this, but if you can't answer based on the sources, I'm curious what your theory is. I mean, this Cadillac guy, as you just said, he's bungling everything. He's a bit of a rogue, he's engaging in the great economy, he's corrupt, but as you say, everyone's doing that. He's lying all the time. So why is he continually so successful? I mean, you said earlier, he's sent to head up that one fort when he has no expertise. He makes his hair ring scheme from Detroit, and everyone pans, and then it goes ahead anyway. Like, why, why, if he's bungling everything, is he still seemingly successful in his career? Well, I think, I go back to my training in early modern France. It's not colonial exceptionalism. This happens in France, too, right? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, <laughs> right? I mean, in colonial spheres, everybody's always talking about that this is some kind of exceptional sphere. And I don't agree with Sh like Shannon Dowdy's argument about rogues, because there were plenty of rogues in France as well. And sometimes it's better the devil you know than the one you don't. He was at least willing to try, and he, had, he was already there. So removing him was a, a fairly difficult thing to do. And when he, he is removed, they remove him from there, and they send him down to Louisiana, right? So he did, he did, he's, not, he's not ever taken out of, of the colonial administration, even for that, for that offense. So, um, you know, I, I really think he's... We have a lot of examples in France where you have intendants and other people who mess things up again and again and again. They and move to another province. They move to another province, sure. and that's the way it works, right? And you yeah. can be a rogue like Villard was about as rogue as you can get. And not yeah. only that, he's exceptionally ill-mannered. So is Shea Holmes, of course. Yes. Right. Yes. But, and and Villard gets everybody pissed off at him. Now, in his case, he's actually a very good general, so he constantly gets himself mm -hmm. out of trouble, but he gets disgraced again and again because of his bad manners. And Getting everybody angry at him, and he goes rogue all the all time. All the time, right? Yeah. Right. As opposed to someone like Vidois, who was a great courtier and wonderful and a total idiot, and and you know 
he was a good provincial governor, but it, in the end, it's a military commission. So, but he kept getting, you know, they kept putting him in charge. He was such a bad military commander when the Austrians captured him, they gave him back for free. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, he's not getting. He's actually poetry at the time. We saw him at the time. We see evidence every day and come up with this obstacle to promotion. It's not like it's changed. Yes, teachers get moved. Or cabinet administrators. Yeah, cabinet administrators. Yes, okay. All right, so we still got a few more minutes. We have until five of them, so. Could I ask, sorry, speaking of his incompetence, from what you said, it doesn't seem like he'd actually been to the place where he built Detroit, right? Or had he? Um, it's not clear that he had, no. So it's not clear do you have any sense of why he chose that particular spot? Or? Well, there had been an ephemeral fort there by an earlier guy in the region, Duluth, um, who kind of didn't have the savvy to turn that in to a permanent spot. But I think one thing that he knew, he could see that perhaps peace was going to come with the Iroquois, and so that would open up this much easier place to get into the Great Lakes, that other passage. Um, the second thing is, I think he did want to siphon off goods to the Iroquois and to the British, and that puts him in a much better spot to do that. So he liked that, and he wanted to get away from the Jesuits, who were constantly telling on him, right? And so he left. He could go down there without them, um, hopefully, and he could also maybe even cause that mission to collapse, which it did after Detroit was founded, the Christian Mackinac mission closed. Um, so it, it was like a good spot for him for a lot of reasons. But there had been travel literature, Lapintan and others who'd written about that spot. And um, he writes later this little, very short uh, article about it, talking about it like it's it's sort of like this garden paradise, right? Uh, that's published in a periodical, the Mercure Gallant. Um, and he talks about it, and there's this is a trope in travel and voyage literature to talk about it like it's a garden of Eden. And and if you you know, if you're not from New France, you think it's crazy. He says it's a very trop it's like a very um, temperate climate, you know, with good winds, and you're thinking, is he crazy? But if you're thinking about it in comparison to the growing climate in, in Montreal and Quebec, it is warmer. And it's a good deal warmer than the other side of the, of the lake that has lake effect snow. The, the, the straits really do protect it and make, make it have less, you know, um, of, a, of a harsh winter. So he's, he maybe, I don't think he probably went there, but he had heard these reports and he thought for a lot of reasons it would work. There's a little less incompetent than those. Yeah, he, he found, he's a, he, and he made friends with this map maker. My, my theory, I can't prove. Is this map maker Frank Alain that on the 92 voyage that he takes to map the New England territories? I think Frank Alain told him because he'd been working with these other guys and he knew he knew that stuff really well. And this map that he sends, uh, Cadillac sends this map to the ministers in 1702, um, he claims he drew it and I don't think he did. I think Frank Alain drew it, the guy that he went along with. So, um, that's my guess. I need to. I would love to be able to prove that. <laughs> Thanks. Coming back to the networks, I'm wondering about if there's any kind of primary reason for any of the decisions that are making you. You know, a lot of this was you're arguing, and I'm very sympathetic to it. That this is mid-level bureaucrats who are kind of uh, leading the decision, running decisions up the ladders. But then when we look at the uh, clients of networks, on the end, it's just. Uh, carrying over that from Colbert. Um, and it just seems as if they're just going with the easiest decisions possible when you're talking about it. Is it those? seem like there is no kind of ideological factionalism within these decisions. You know, you kind of uh, put away the idea of this imperial map making or map drawing. Um, I'm wondering how you know all of the logistics of people getting placed in their spots is happening. Is it just, he's been there. Let's just go with that because I have no other better idea. Is this almost uh, total ignorance within the center, rather than the exact opposite, which is a lot of the argument, which is this, you know, the central decision making emanating out. You know, I mean, is this just a 
I think there's not that many people to choose from, right? So the number of officials in New France and Caribbean is really quite small. And so you just don't have a huge pot of people to choose from, and you have to choose the people who are already there and have somewhat expertise. And you see the same thing, I think, happening in the Caribbean as well, where you know a few people offer themselves up, and then there's a few who've been there, um, and you choose the people who are allotted to you. In one of the other chapters, I make the argument that it's, it's, though it's not just enclosed within um, the governor to the minister, and that and, and within the Department of Naming Colonies, but there's this other group of elites, um, you know, who are members of the Royal Academies, who are members of uh, a whole host of other kinds of institutions that are pressuring for expansion, right? And they have been very much backers of LaSalle and LaSalle's voyages. And these are the guys who are trying to publish those receptive de voyage, in some cases really heavily editing or reworking them. And there's this little group, and they're pushing very hard the ministers to, to seize the moment and really expand. So it's interesting, they're kind of um, extra governmental pressure groups as well as the government itself, but they just don't have that many people to choose from, right? So they've got to choose who they have. There's also, again, back to the Metropole, in Sarah's first book, and then that's meant to be wild, there was a big shift at the moment of Pontchart found that in Colbert's day, or with Le Pelletier, they tended to fire all the Antennals. They bring in their own people. And Colbert, except for Bouchou, moved the Antennals around all the time. And Pontchartin doesn't do that. And the amount of time that each Antennal stays in their generalité expands really much a lot longer. And it doesn't just sort of clean house. And this is really a significant shift. And in the 18th century, it carries forward. So it's also, a, there is a moment here that, you know, as your work and her work have shown, that there's a stabilization moment and we're getting less of this bringing your own client network. It's more like bring the group that's already there to turn me into the clients rather than bring the whole. And part of that has to do with the expertise. Mm -hmm. Chris is over there, so signaling us to get out of here. All right. Yeah. So. Thank you.